I walk up to the checkout line after going to the grocery store to get a couple of things, and I'm surprised to see how many people are there. It seems everybody in the store must have finished up their shopping at the exact same time. There's four or maybe five checkout lines open and several people in each one of those lines. So I pick one. I pick one and I watch as every other line seems to just speed by. Yet here I am waiting, waiting and waiting and waiting. And then it's almost my turn. And the person in front of me asks for a price check on something. It seems something didn't ring up at what she thought was the right price. So they had to call somebody and somebody had to come back up. And then she had she forgot something, so she has to run to the back and pick it up. I'm irate. I'm completely furious. It's not only this. This is just a triggering event. I'm pissed off. Why can't I ever pick the right line? Why do I always have to wait for everybody? Oh, this is frustrating. So, needless to say, it ruined my day, or at least it ruined a couple of hours for me. Now, several years later, I learned that the speed of checkout lines is completely outside of my control. And if it's outside of my control, it's literally not worth my time or effort to think about or worry about. Further, a little bit of mathematical analysis would tell me that it's almost impossible to pick the fastest lane. If there's five lines open, I've got a one in five chance of picking the fastest one, or a 20% chance of being in the fastest lane. That means if I'm in any of the other 80%, I'm going to see another line move faster than me. If there's 10 lanes, there's only a 10% chance that I'm going to pick the fastest one. Plus, I know enough to know that I probably just forgot all the times that I was in the fast one. I don't notice how slow the other lines are going when I'm in the fastest one. So this is a stupid thing to be mad about. I've learned now that it's not even worth my anger. I don't get angry anymore at checkout lines. Now, consider traffic. A lot of people fall victim to road rage. It's very easy to do. Somebody's cutting you off, or somebody doesn't use a blinker, or somebody's going too slow, or somebody's going too fast, and we get very irate. There's too much traffic. There's more traffic than we thought. We didn't plan for this traffic. We're going to be late for that breakfast that we're going to. That can be frustrating. We yell, we scream, we get our blood pressure up. And for what? Traffic is outside of our control. Now we have some more control over the steps we take next time, but the situation that we're in right now, we have no control of this traffic. Being upset is completely up to us. There's no reason to be angry at all. Now, neither of these two examples are financial in nature, but they help drive home the point. There are, there are events, there are things that happen to us, and our decisions can impact whether or not we get angry in the first place. If we can prevent anger from even coming into our world, if we can keep anger away, then we don't have to figure out how to deal with anger. It just doesn't exist. That's how I want you to view all financial setbacks that happen to you. We'll talk more about financial setbacks and how to avoid negative emotion that comes with them right after this. Hey there, it's Derek Hagen. I'm a financial therapist, author, and speaker here with another Money Health presentation where we're going to talk about overcoming setbacks. Or preventing setbacks in a sense. Um, you're going to see me use quotes, preventing setbacks, because we're going to talk a lot about how we frame those. Just like with the traffic, just like with the shopping lines. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier when we were talking about checkout lines or traffic. Let's use checkout lines for this example. Earlier on, you're recognizing here that this is time moving this way. If I sat there and dwelled on how angry and how upset I was at the fact that here it is again, I'm pissed off because I can never pick the right checkout line, this I'm going to be angry for a long time. That's a long time to be angry. Now, you might say a better way to deal with that anger is just to accept it. And that's fine. So I save a little bit of time. 
but I'm still angry for a long time. Mindfulness helps. I'm a big proponent of mindfulness. With mindfulness, you pay very close attention to the raw sensations of the anger, and the half-life tends to disappear. So here, we lost again some more time, but we still have anger. And that anger is likely to come back when we're mindless and not mindful. So why don't we just not get angry in the first place? We don't need to climb this ladder. You might think, oh, come on. Bad things happen. You have to get angry. Anger is natural. Anger is natural. To which I say, sure, bad things just like the checkout line. I can choose not to be angry at that checkout line. Just like I can choose not to get angry in traffic, and I can choose not to get angry when there's an unexpected expense. I can choose not to get angry if my investments go down, and I can choose not to get angry if I were to lose my job. Now, if you watched last week's presentation, we talked about setbacks will occur, 100% chance. So if you look here, you can hope all you want that setbacks don't occur. You can dwell on them. You can learn from them. You can expect them. No matter what you do with those setbacks, they're going to happen. It's the, the, it's the same likelihood that they're going to happen, no matter what. So you might as well learn from them or you might as well expect them because they're going to happen. And so we need to break this feedback loop. This is a positive feedback loop, positive not meaning that it's good, a positive feeding feedback loop meaning that it feeds itself. So you feel bad and then you feel bad about feeling bad. Then you feel bad about being the kind of person that feels bad about feeling bad and around and around and around you go. Breaking that cycle is the key to maintaining your tranquility, to maintaining your happiness, to not let anger and sadness and resentment and other negative emotion creep into your life. Now, gratitude, gratitude is the antidote. These two people here are in the same position. This person here is looking forward and saying, ugh, look how hard this is going to be. Or what if I had more? Or why don't I have that? And this person is going to be filled with negative emotion. Now, this person, on the other hand, same exact place, looking backwards, saying, look how far I've come, or look how much I have, or look how much I still have, or look how much I've learned. This person is going to be happier. This person is going to be sad. This person is going to be happy. Shine your light of attention on the areas of your life that are good. Now, expert level gratitude is called negative visualization. In negative visualization, you consider all of the things that you have. That's this big circle here. This here, this is the, everything that you own. Everything that you have, you have your abilities, you have your eyesight, you have your ability to walk, you have your relationships, you have your job. You have all these things. Negative visualization asks you to imagine losing something. Imagine losing your eyesight. Imagine losing your, um, a relationship. Imagine losing your job. And then realize that hasn't happened. It could happen. And it could have already happened. But it didn't. And you still have it. Now what this really does is it helps you stop taking your life for granted. People who partake in negative visualization, have fewer regrets. They have fewer regrets because they, they live in the moment. They, they appreciate the things that they have a lot more. Another way you can practice gratitude is to, to do what's called the, the last time meditation. And the last time meditation says, all experiences that you have will happen for the last time. And this is true of good experiences. You know, you're doing something right now. Is this going to be the last time? Maybe not, but maybe it is. And you've certainly done things that have already happened for the last time. But you probably didn't know they were the last time when it was happening. So how can you frame negative experiences this way? There are negative experiences for which we look back 
and say to ourselves, man, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I still did that. Or it was hard at the time, but I wish I could do it again. I didn't know that was going to be the last time. So viewing that through this lens, are you having a rough time? This might be the last time this happens to you. A non-financial example that I like is when you get a new puppy, for example, you have to take it outside all the time to go to the bathroom. No matter what. No matter if it's cold, no matter if it's raining, no matter if it's snowing, no matter if it's windy, no matter if it's the middle of the night, you have to go outside with the dog. In the moment, that can feel stressful and you don't want to do it. I'm too tired. But many people with old dogs look back on their time with a puppy and kind of reminisce about the, the quote unquote good old days. So why are we wishing to get rid of the good old days while we're in them? This might be the last time I take my dog out to go to the bathroom because it will be potty trained maybe tomorrow. So think about that in terms of your financial life. You're having a hard time. This might be the last time. And if it's a really hard time, then it might be good that this experience ends and you can you can reminisce on this being the last time there. So reframing. We're going to talk a lot about reframing. If a problem drops in your lap, if, if a setback happens to you, this is much like the game of poker. You get dealt some cards. You didn't get to choose which cards those were, but now that you have them, you have to play them to the best of your ability to give yourself the best chance of winning. If a setback happens to you, you no longer have a choice about whether or not you're going to get the setback. It's now yours to do something with. So complaining about this setback, getting mad about this setback, getting sad about this setback, those don't change the fact that you have to do something now about this setback. So if we can reframe these setbacks, that's going to help prevent that negative emotion from creeping in. This is the ticket, reframing that setback the second you know that the setback is happening. So a reframing is just changing how you talk about something. Calling something 90% lean and calling something 10% fat is the same thing, but it sounds different. Calling something a 25% chance of failing and a 75% chance of succeeding is the same thing, but it sounds different. With weather, there's a 30% chance it's going to rain tomorrow, but there's a 70% chance that it's not going to rain tomorrow. It's the same thing but we get to choose what we're focusing on. So that's the idea behind reframing. So the first idea is, instead of even thinking about a setback as being a failure, don't resist this, or rather resist this tendency that a setback is a failure. Get this idea out of your mind. There's only, there's only two things that can happen. You can win or you can learn. Winning and learning. The only real failure is leaving a setback without the lesson. If you don't get the lesson, that's the only failure. So there's an opportunity for growth when you think about what happened to me. We actually need setbacks, as you, as you found out in that last video. Because without them, we never learn how to deal with adversity. And life is short. You get to experience this life. You were born. You didn't choose to be born. It's an accident that you're here. You get a few dozen trips around this star that we call the sun. And then you're out. You're gone again. Enjoy it. Stop talking about in terms of I have to. I have to sounds like you don't want to. Oh, I have to do this. I have to go to work. I have to work this weekend. I have to pay my taxes. And reframe this as I get to. I get to go to work. I get to work this weekend. Right? How many people don't have jobs and would happily go back to work and work on the weekends? Right? Or even experiences. Right? I have to take the dog out. I get to take the dog out. Start to reframe and, and try to get I have to out of your vocabulary and replace it with I get to. 
Because remember, choosing to call a setback, reframe a setback as an interesting problem to solve or a challenge, this is the single best thing for you. So the setback drops in your lap. Now you have to do something about it. If you let yourself get angry, if you let yourself get sad, if you let yourself get resentful or any other bad feeling, you're not going to come up with the best solution. You're going to be clouded with emotion. But whether you're clouded with emotion or not, you still have to solve this problem. There's still a setback. Stop yourself when you feel a setback and you start to feel angry or start to feel sad. This is a good trick. Just say to yourself in your head or out loud if you're by yourself, stop, stop, stop. How can I solve this problem? This is an interesting problem to solve. So, and this is really your choice. You get to choose. Do you want to say, I wonder what the best way forward is? This is an interesting problem to solve. Or do you want to say, oh, what was me? I'm so pissed off. No. You come up to the checkout line. The checkout line is full. And you say, well, I guess I can sit here and think about what I want to write about next week. Or think about that book that I was reading. Or I can write a list. Or I can text some people. Or I can call somebody. Or you can do like I used to do and get angry and ruin your whole day. But the choice is up to you. Reframe these setbacks as challenges. View them as opportunities to learn and opportunities to solve interesting problems. And then it's going to be like the setback didn't even happen. That's how we prevent setbacks. And that's good money help.